Well, good morning. Is it well with you this morning? Hallelujah, Father. Let's go ahead and lift our hands for just a second. <clears throat> Father, we need you desperately. And we have not come here today, Father, because it's a duty. We've come here because it's an honor to hear from your spirit. And we know that, Father, you create wellness with words. So we ask you, Father, that you would clear our ears, that we would not be distracted. Father, our minds would not wander. And that we could receive wholeness this morning by your word. For your word is the answer to every human dilemma. And so we just thank you that this is your time to give us your word. You are the teacher. We are the students. And we have gathered here this morning to be taught by your spirit in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah, Father. <clears throat> well, several of you, I'm going to go ahead and, and several of you saw me uh, hobbling around on crutches. And so I don't have to say it individually to every single person. The reason I'm on crutches is because even though I've got an amazing Superman-like physique, I discovered I'm not Superman because a bendable toe hit an immovable object and uh, my foot swelled up. So uh, I'm trying to stay off of it. Pastor Burgess, is that you? No? You look just like Pastor Burgess. Right there. I'm sorry. Huh? John Bolden? You look just like Pastor Burgess, man. I was going to say, what are you doing here? Wait, I'm glad you're here, sir. Sorry for the mistaken identity. All right. Hallelujah, Father. Well, I tell you what I want to do is I want to go ahead and jump right into the Word. Is that okay? And uh, Sister Sylvia, remember, remind me at the end of service to receive the offering as you always do. I don't want to miss it. But I do want to get into this, and uh, I'll probably end up sitting on this, but I'm going to try and move so I can chase some rabbits today. We are finishing up our series uh, the Advent series, and we've spoken about love, we've spoken about joy, and we've spoken about hope. And today we're going to end our Advent series with talking about peace. Amen. In fact, the, if you'll go put Luke chapter 2 up on the screen, one of the things that we'll discover is that at the very, at the very first Advent, the coming of Christ, the proclamation of the angels had to do with peace. In Luke chapter 2, Verse 13, the scripture says this, And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace. Everyone say peace. peace. On earth, peace among men with whom he is pleased. And I want to tell you this, he is pleased with you. Amen. So peace is yours. And one of the things, you know, I, I love studying words. I'm a word geek. And whenever I'm going to teach on a topic, I, I like to do a search and see how many times that's mentioned in the Bible. And so I want you to understand the importance of peace because the enemy will do everything he can to rob you of peace. And you need to understand how necessary peace is, how valuable peace is. Treat it like a treasure and do not let it go just because something comes into your life to trouble you or disturb you. Amen. Remember last week we talked about joy. And one of the things that we said about joy is joy is greater than adversity. Amen. The same is true about peace. Peace is greater than trouble. Yeah. Peace does not evaporate because trouble comes. Uh -huh. Actually, the Bible says that he is a very present help. He being the prince of peace. Yeah is a very present help in the midst of trouble. Amen. Right? Yes. Now here's what I want to, I want to share this with you. I shared this with my wife yesterday. I looked up the words that we have taught on over the past four weeks. Remember we taught about love. Love, just a simple word search, not all of its variations, but love is mentioned 311 times in the Bible. Wow. Hope, we talked about hope. Hope is mentioned 132 times in the Bible. And then we spoke about joy. Joy is mentioned 170 times in the Bible. 
Now, we haven't taught about faith, but if I had taught about faith in this Advent series, faith is taught, mentioned 232 times in the Bible. But here's what I want you to hear. This is how important peace is. Peace is mentioned 333 times in the Bible. So of, of, of love, hope, joy, and faith, peace is spoken of more often than all of them. See, because you and I were not designed to be broken. Amen. We were not designed to be damaged, dysfunctional people. Amen. We were designed by God in perfection. Yeah. Come on. You understand that? Uh -huh. Now, let's go, let's go to the book of John before I get too far. And, and I probably won't be able to do my happy dance this morning <laughs> or any Motown moves. So use your imagination, and you can picture me doing Motown moves. And if I have to, I'll call Lamar up to do the happy dance, and we'll live victoriously through Lamar. Amen. Amen? Go to the book of John. I want you to see this. John chapter 14, verse 27 says, Peace I leave with you. This is the master speaking. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. Amen. Now, you remember we, we mentioned everything we've taught. We taught about the difference between biblical love and worldly love. The world has a counterpart to everything that's biblical. The world has a hope, and we, we, we covered this, but the worldly hope ain't like godly hope, Amen. right? We spoke about joy and its counterpart being happy, and happy ain't the same as joy. Amen. Remember that? We talk, happy's fickle. If your circumstances change, your happiness evaporates, but joy is greater than adversity. You can be joy-filled in the middle of a battle, right? When, and so all the things that we've spoken of, the earth has a counterpart, but it ain't like what God gives. And that's what Jesus says right here. Jesus said, my peace, I leave with you. Not as the world gives, do I give. So the world has a type of peace it gives. But it's not the same thing. Amen. And see, we got to understand that because if we don't understand the difference, we'll settle for the counterfeit. And then we become as fragile as that is what we accept. See, the world's peace is nothing more than the absence of trouble. That's all it is. It is literally defined as the absence of trouble or a lack of disturbance. And as an illustration, if you've ever gone up to like a pond or a small body of water and it's absolutely tranquil, not a ripple, not a wave, perfectly smooth, and you tend to look at it and say, isn't that peaceful? And it is. Until you do something as simple as grab a pebble, a tiny little pebble, and you drop it onto the surface of that water, you've now created ripples. You have disturbed the peace, and the peace has evaporated. It's no longer peaceful. It's troubled waters. That's the type of peace the world has. You and I can't make it through life with that type of peace because then we're always seeking the absence of trouble. And if you're, listen, if you're always seeking the absence of trouble, you become easily manageable by the devil. Hear me when I tell you this, because if you're always seeking the absence of trouble, all he has to do to get you out of where you are is cause a little bit of trouble and you'll go running away. This is the reason why some people are always searching for new churches, new relationships, new wives, new husbands. Because they're looking for that place that's the absence of trouble. Because they say, i got to have some peace, baby. Well, peace that Jesus gives is not the absence of trouble. It's something that's greater than the trouble you're in. You can be peaceful in troubled times. Right? Now, this is what the angel said. The angel said, because of the coming of this great Messiah, there will be peace on earth among men. Now, there's no doubting about it. Our world is not peaceful. Our world is troubled. But G the Bible says that Jesus will undo the damage that sin did. You're following me this morning. The world needs peace. The proclamation is that there will be peace on earth. 
Here's what I want to say to you today. I'm not going to keep you too terribly long, but I do want you to understand this. How does Jesus bring peace on earth? He does it by faith, and he does it one at a time. What does that mean? That means your job is to hold on to your peace. So if he can make your world peaceful, and he does it one person at a time, pretty soon there's peace on earth. But there's not peace on earth when there's the absence of faith in Christ. You see, for the purpose of study, it's great to break all these things apart. It's great to look at faith and just preach on faith. And it's amazing to look at love and just teach on love. And that's great for the purpose of study. But in operation, they all work together. Because you don't have any faith if you don't have love, for faith worketh by love. And it's only by faith that we ever access joy. It's only by faith we have any hope. And it's only by faith we'll ever know peace. And you and I were designed to be creatures of peace. The Bible says peace is meant to rule in our hearts. Everyone say this with me. I was not designed to be dysfunctional. I was not designed to be damaged. Each and every one of us have been damaged. And we've all encountered pain at some point. That's just what life does. But that's not by divine design. That's what sin has done. Can I want to, listen, God did not ordain you to misery. He saved you from misery. He did not ordain you to pain. He did not ordain that you be damaged. The devil did that. His peace comes and restores everything that the devil stole from you. But you and I have got to just cement this in the frontal lobes of our mind. I was not created by God to be damaged. I was not created by God to be a blue light special because I'm dysfunctional. I was created by God in perfection. There was no imperfection in the original creation. Those of us who have put our faith in Christ, we've been recreated. The recreation is no less than the original creation. We are recreated in perfection. Spiritually, you and I got our acts together. Spiritually, there's nothing broken. There's nothing missing. We are Christ-like. Now, the difference between us and Adam is this. Adam had nothing to overcome. He was created perfect in a perfect setting. He had no concept of pain. He had no experience with sickness. He didn't have to overcome past experiences. Y'all understand what I'm saying? But now you and I, when we give our lives to Christ, now this is why the Bible says that we must work out our own salvation. It's not that we work our salvation. It's that we grow in it. In the renewing of our mind, we discover who we are in him so we can finally become the perfect creatures he made us to be. So that you and I can have, is this okay this morning? You and I can eventually say, just like Jesus said, to see me is to see the Father. That's God's objective. That's his goal. That you and I, as the sons and daughters, be perfect replications of Jesus Christ. Jesus was not broken. Jesus was not dysfunctional. And the Bible says, even as he is, so are we in this world. So you and I have got to value peace. And we've got to, listen, I've had people come up to me when I'm preaching along these lines and they'll say, well, pastor, isn't life good enough? Are you kidding me? Who gave you the right to settle for good enough? No, no, no. You and I are to strive for perfection. We're to strive for the ideal that God has for our life. And as long as there's anything broken, as long as there's anything missing, as long as there's anything damaged, you and I got to keep pushing in praise and pushing in the word, and we need to keep pressing until everything is restored. Everything. It's not good enough that you're 99% there. Everything. Everything. 
Everyone say peace. peace. This is God's ideal for you. Now, as Jesus said, he said, I'm giving you a kind of peace that ain't like what the world gives. The world gives you the peace is only the absence of trouble. But as soon as trouble comes, peace evaporates. And, and if that's what controls your life, as I said, then you're easily manageable by the devil because all he has to do is make you uncomfortable and you go running somewhere else hoping that somebody somewhere will celebrate you and you'll finally know peace. Baby, you ain't never going to know peace because he ain't never going to let you alone. You're going to be running your whole life looking for that perfect place instead of becoming the perfect person. Jesus said, I'm going to give you another kind of peace. Now, typically, the peace that Jesus is in the Old Testament, we all know it, it's shalom. In the Greek, it's arene, counterpart, same thing. And it literally means this, wholeness, completeness, where you are all together, all together. That everything is as it should be, that your mind is not troubled. I wish somebody was listening to me. Yes, yes. That your heart is not fragmented. That your soul is not damaged. Your body is not pain racked. Everything is as it should be. And the peace of God works on the inside and affects the outside. Yes. This is what Jesus said. I'm, I'm coming to give you wholeness. Because you weren't designed to operate at 50%. Hmm. But too many of us, listen, we, 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 we have been conditioned to believe that we can't always be at peace. I've been reconditioned to believe that we can. In fact, I've said it before. I think one of the greatest operations of the Holy Ghost in the life of God's people is this. He gives you a drama-free, peace-filled lifestyle. Have you, have you ever been with somebody who just does not serve God? You got family members who do not serve God and you call them and you say, how's it going? And then they tell you how it's going. And then you realize God has been good to me because I ain't gone to jail last week. I didn't get pulled over by the popo. I didn't. All these things didn't happen. I got family members. They ought to write soap operas. You call them and you find out who, well, I, he, well you know, so-and-so just went to jail. Well, I thought he just got out of jail. Yeah, he was out of jail for a day and they put him back into jail. And I look at my wife and I realize, you know, baby, we got it good. That drama-free lifestyle because you're managed by peace. Your home is not a place where arguments reign and it's filled with bitterness and strife. It's, when people walk into your home, they can feel the peace. And they're like, man, this, it feels good in here. Why? Because peace reigns in this home. And here's, I want to say this to you. If it's your home and you're a child of God, peace ought to be reigning in your home. Your home ought to be a sanctuary that people can tell the difference when they walk into your home. Mm. Hallelujah, Father. Go to Mark chapter 5. Is this okay this morning? This morning what I want to do is I want to, I want to give you biblically what peace is. Because if you know what it is, you know what you're striving for and you won't settle for anything else. Listen, if you want to go get a leather jacket, don't settle for pleather. You understand what I'm saying? It, it, it might look the same, but it don't feel the same, and it don't smell the same, and it don't wear the same. There's no such thing as genuine, authentic, artificial. If you want to get genuine, you get genuine. And you walk right by the pleather because you're going for the leather. And that's the way you and I ought to be in life. We ought to be going for God's standard, God's ideal. God said that we would have a life that's filled with more than enough, that he would fill our houses with good and godly things, that he'd fill our heart with hope. He'd fill our mind with sanctified imaginations, great dreams, big dreams. If, if I, I, hmm. D.L. Moody said, if God is your partner, dream big. Make big plans. If you and I are striving after God, then we don't settle for what the world says is good enough. Hallelujah, Father. So I want to give you an illustration. It's by no means the only illustration, but it's a really good illustration of God's kind of peace. If you would, go with me to the book of Mark, chapter 5. 
In Mark chapter 5, we all know that there was a woman. This woman had had a hemorrhage of blood for 12 years. This woman was an outcast. This woman had been ostracized from family, from friends, and from neighbors. You want to talk about isolation? This woman had been in isolation, quarantined for 12 years. If she had had a husband, and there's every reason to believe she did, she had had no contact with her husband for 12 years. If she had had children, and there's no reason to think she didn't, she had had no contact with her children for 12 years. Because in the time and culture that she lived, she was considered unclean. Well, let's just go ahead and read it. Chapter 20, or Mark chapter 5, verse 25. <clears throat> a woman who had had a hemorrhage for 12 years, verse 26, and had endured much at the hands of many physicians and had spent all that she had had and was not helped at all, but rather had grown worse. This woman, I want to give you four levels of brokenness. And remember, God didn't design you to be broken. God didn't design you to have a broken heart. Do you know there's healing for the brokenhearted? He'll mend and bind up the broken of heart. Because God didn't design you for broken dreams. He didn't design you for a broken mind. He didn't design you for a broken body. This woman was relationally broken. As I already said, in the culture that she lived in, she had had no contact. Isolation is the worst type of punishment. Do you know this? If, if you go to jail, and in jail you prove to be bad, you know where they put you? Isolation. Because it's the worst type of punishment. Isolation, being cut off even from other criminals, is bad because we were not designed for isolation. This woman had been isolated. She was relationally damaged. She was physically broken. She was emotionally broken. You know, the Bible says hope deferred makes the heart sick. Can you imagine every time she visited a doctor and the doctor said, I've got some new experimental way to fix your hemorrhage and it'll work and it didn't? Hope deferred makes the heart sick. She was emotionally broken from constant disappointments. And then, of course, we read that she had spent all that she'd had. Now, I want to ask you all a question. You all ready for this? If you spend all that you have, how much you got left? If you got no money, what do we say that is? You broke. You broke, you busted, and you disgusted. This woman had spent all that she had had. And she had not gotten better, she'd only gotten worse. She was broken in almost every conceivable way. What an illustration about the God of peace. See, God will always meet you right where you are, Amen. to take you where you need to be. Yeah. He doesn't judge you because for 12 years you've endured brokenness. He heals you of the brokenness. Too many times our Father is presented as if he's judging us for our mistakes. Can I tell you something? He already took into account all of your failures, all of your mistakes, and all of your sins, and he put them on a thing called the cross. So your mistakes do not define you. Your failures do not define you. Your years of pain do not define you. You can receive healing from all of that. So let's continue the story. This woman says in verse 28, I want to read this to you out of the Amplified. She kept saying. Now many translations say she thought within herself. And they're all, both are right. Neither one's wrong. Because you can't say what you haven't thought. You simply cannot do it. Every word begins as a thought. She thought it and she said it and she kept thinking it so she kept saying it. What did she say? She said, if I only touch his garments, if I can just get to where he is... She said, I shall be restored to health. Yeah, yeah. Now, that word restored in the Greek, what she was saying is, I shall be sozoed. Uh -huh. right. What? I'll be ev everything will be restored. Yeah. I will no longer be a social outcast because my hemorrhage will stop. 
I'll no longer be broken. I'll no longer be financially destitute. Right. She, mm, listen, can, can I chase a rabbit? I probably ain't going to catch it because I'm hobbling today and rabbits are really fast. <laughs> but I still need to give it, a, a, give it an effort. Amen. Jesus asked a question of the people who went out to go see John. He said, what did you go out there to see? The question for us is, why do we come to church? Do you come to church to be entertained, or do you come to church to be made whole? See, you and I, listen, if we will set our sight on the right things, every time we come into contact with God's Word, whether through sermon or song, every time we come into contact with God, it's an opportunity for wholeness. Amen. What do we come to see? Do we come to see whether the worship team can really entertain us this time? Or do we come into the church saying, I am through being sick. I am through being tired. And I'm through being poor. If I can just get to where he is. If I can just get into the presence of the almighty, infinite love of God. I shall be sozo. Yes. How's he going to do it? I don't know. I ain't worried about that. The Bible doesn't tell us how God restored this woman's fortune. But we know that he did because he said, go your way, be healed, and be whole. Be healed. The hemorrhage is going to stop. But be whole. Everything that had left you broken is now restored unto you. He'll do it if we'll just, listen, if we will simply set our faith, you'll always, expectation plays a huge role in what we find. I've been in the ministry long enough. There are some people who come to a church simply to find the faults. They will. I've known people who have gone to a church of a thousand people and they found the one hypocrite in the whole place. The one. And then they'll say, well, you know what? I ain't going back because that whole place is filled with hypocrites. No, you found the one yeah. out of a thousand. Yeah. Why? Because you weren't looking for the faithful ones. You weren't looking for the friendly ones. You weren't looking for the, 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 the joy-filled ones. You were looking for the one who would fit your narrative so you could have an excuse to never go back. Amen. Why are you saying that, Pastor. Because it's true. What we expect to find, we most often do. So if you come to church expecting to level up, you will. If you come to church, if you enter his courts with thanksgiving and you come before him with praise, you will be made whole. Because God loves you too much to keep us at the place he finds us. Is this okay this morning? There's no reason to go another day without peace of mind. There's no reason to go another day without restoration. When I'm talking restoration, I'm talking HGTV type restoration, where in one half hour, they change the whole house. In one minute of time, God can totally change your life. How did he do it? I don't know how he did it. I went to church broken and I left whole. I went to church hurting and I left at peace. Now let's look at verse 34. Mark chapter 5, verse 34. Reading it to you again out of the Amplified. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith, your trust and confidence in me, springing up from faith in God, has restored you to health. And if that was where he stopped talking, that would have been amazing. Because for 12 years, not one doctor had been able to change this. But he did. Everyone say, but God. Yeah. See, people may fail you, but God. Yeah. People may lie to you, but God. People may disappoint and hurt and inflict you with pain, but never ignore the God factor. Come on, man. What doctors couldn't do, Jesus did. Yeah. But he didn't stop here. He said, go in. And I like how the Amplified says it, go in, into peace. Go into wholeness. Now, you remember when Jesus said, 
my peace I live you, not as the world leaves you or gives you. Let not your heart, everyone say, let not. See, you and I got a choice. The Bible talks about us pursuing peace, not peace pursuing us. If you don't value peace enough to pursue it, you'll never experience it. It's there for you. It's a divine gift. It's part of the Advent season. It's what Jesus came to give you. But if we don't connect faith to his proclamations, are y'all listening to me? Faith is always required. It's not automatic. He said, I'm going to leave you an extraordinary gift called peace. This peace is not only going to bring tranquility to your environment, it's going to be wholeness to your whole experience. You're going to know what I had in mind when I created you by this thing called peace. Because there will be nothing broken. Can you imagine a life with nothing broken? Everything working. Everything in its place. That's the ideal of God for you. That when you wake up in the morning, you ain't got to fix nothing. Because everything that you need is there. In fact, in God's ideal. Ooh, that hurt. In God's ideal. Not only do you have an, an abundance of peace and an abundance of good things, but it's good measure. It's pressed down. It's shaken together. And it's running over. He wants to bless you with so much peace that you got to tell everyone about it so that they get affected by it. He wants to bless you with so many things you ain't got room to contain it, so you got to look for places to distribute it. Everyone say peace. That's God's gift to you at Christmas time. And it doesn't end when this season ends. Just because the calendar flips its pages, God doesn't change his mind. Mm. I think I'm going to stay down here rather than climb that step. That's like Mount Everest today. Go in, listen to this, go into peace and be continually healed and freed from your distressing bodily disease. I want to say it again. Every encounter with God is an opportunity for peace. Every encounter with God is an opportunity for peace. Yes, sir. But what are we coming to do? If we're coming to be entertained, that's the best you can hope for. But if you're coming with the expectation, I'm going to meet Jesus today. Where are you going to meet him? I'm going to meet him in a gymnasium that's got, that's got basketball hoops up above. But I'm going to turn that gymnasium into a temple of praise because I'm going to lift my hands in the midst of my trouble. I'm going to proclaim his goodness and I'm going to lift my voice. And say, you are the prince of peace. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> what is peace? Let's go ahead and let me, let me quit following some side notes. What is peace? Peace is wholeness. That's what it is. It's wholeness. I remember years ago, sometimes when I'm preaching, I make statements without really thinking about them because they come from down here and not up here. And I remember one time and when I said it, I thought, oh, God, I hope I'm right. I said, God is holy because he's the only one completely whole. He has no need to lie because he's completely whole. You know, when we lie, we're lying to impress or cover up because we're trying to cover up our brokenness or we're trying to impress because we feel we're deficient. The reason why God never lies is because he doesn't need to lie to impress. He's completely impressive because he's completely whole. You understand? And so I said, the reason God is holy, it's not a moral thing. It's a whole together thing. He's not holy because he shines in the dark. He's holy because there's nothing broken in him. There's nothing missing in him. And then sometime later, I was listening to Jack Hayford preach. And Jack Hayford is a world-class theologian and scholar. And Jack Hayford said, you know why God is holy? And I thought, ooh, I really do, because I, I, I just said something last week, and I want to know if I'm wrong. He said, he said God is holy because he's completely whole. Amen. I went back to my Catholic days and did the sign of the cross. Thank you, Father. 
You see, the reason I'm saying that is this. You and I, in, our, in striving to be holy, it's not about the clothes we wear. It's not about our hairstyle. It's not about our makeup or our lack of makeup. It's not the external things. Our holiness is when we are completely whole. Yes, right. And I no longer have to lie to impress you. I don't have to steal from you because I got too much as it is. I don't need to manipulate you because I got more than enough. Amen. Come on. When I'm all together whole, yes. then I am holy even as he is holy. Do you see the importance that peace plays in this? So peace is wholeness. Peace is not the absence of trouble. Jesus had trouble. Do you know that? Jesus had trouble. He had people that, get this, they didn't like him. They were his enemies. They caused him problems. But in the midst of his troubles, he never abdicated his title as Prince of Peace. He was always peaceful. He was always at peace, no matter what was going on around him. Even when it was coming up to the point of his death, he told him, you can't kill me. The only way I'm going to die is I've got to lay my life down. Amen. So he was at peace because he knew something you and I need to cement into our minds. Yes, sir. Greater is he yes, sir. that is in me yes, than he that is in the world. Yes, and while we're talking about that, let's just go ahead and throw this out. No weapon formed against me can prosper and no word spoken over me in judgment will work because I can condemn it. Mm, don't ever let anything take your peace. The Bible says this, listen, He is the God of peace, the Lord of peace, the Prince of peace, the wellspring of peace. Peace is greater than trouble, greater than brokenness, and greater than pain. Isaiah chapter 54, verse 10. For the mountains may be removed, and the hills may shake, Paused for dramatic effect. The mountains, something so cataclysmic may happen in your life that it seems as if the very mountains themselves are moved. You all ever experienced something like that? It could be a phone call, an email, a knock at the door. The mountains may be removed and the hills may shake, but my loving kindness will not be removed from you and my covenant of peace shall not be shaken. Amen. Is God not good? Amen. His word is amazing. You know, the Bible says that when he speaks over you, he speaks words of peace. Do you know what God's declaration is over you? Peace. When you're troubled, his word over you is peace. When the mountains of your life are being shaken, God is declaring in heaven over you peace. Why? Because I left you my peace. Don't be troubled. It's going to be okay. But God, the mountains themselves are shaken. Don't worry about that. My covenant of peace will not be shaken. Because peace is greater than our environment. Just like joy, peace is spiritual, not conditional. Peace is spiritual, not circumstantial. This is the reason why everything around you can evaporate and you can be that oddball that stands there, not distressed, not discouraged, not despondent, lifting your hands in praise. Why? Because you have peace that passes understanding. I don't know if this is helping you, but it's blessing me. What does that mean when the Bible says it passes understanding? It literally means this. It makes no sense. Right. You've got peace that makes no sense. Amen. Why? Because everything in your life appears to be falling apart. The mountains that you thought would hide you are shaken. Amen. The hills around you are moving. Right. But you're trusting in a covenant of peace from an invisible God. Amen. And you become greater than your environment. Mm. 
John chapter 16, verse 33. These things I have spoken to you, so that in me, everyone say in me. me. See, here's one of the keys. Don't don't go outside him. How do you know when you step outside of him? If you stepped outside of love, you stepped outside of him. See, I told you they all work together. Stay in love no matter what the provocation, no matter what they say, no matter what they do. Don't don't go after them, baby. They're leading you down a dark alley because there's a trap. You don't go chasing them no matter what the provocation. You stay in that refuge of peace. And you say, I am not going to be moved. I am not going to be shaken. I ain't chasing you. I'm pursuing peace. These things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. The peace is yours. It's mine. He left it to us. Now, I don't know about you, but on Christmas morning, actually, I started about Christmas Eve begging my wife to let me open one. I just want one. We can retape it up after I open it. I just want to know what's inside of one. Because I have that type of personality. If you give me a gift, I want it. And it don't matter what it is. In fact, I got to say, Oreos with a dipping cup? Mm. Brilliant. Brilliant. My wife asked me yesterday, did you break into it? I said, no. (laughs) Not yet. Don't worry. If you don't know what I'm talking about, has nothing, it was my gift. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what I'm saying to you is this. If there's a gift under the tree, if, if it's got my name on it, I'm opening it. And I'm that way with everything that God has gifted me. Amen. I am, un, listen, listen, I am unwilling to appease Woo. small-minded people yeah. Come on. by leaving a gift that God gave me under the tree. Yeah. Yeah. If he said, son, I want you whole, I don't care how you feel about it, I'm going to be whole. Yeah. If he said, son, I want you prosperous, then I don't care how small-minded people feel about it. I'm going to be prosperous. Because if he, listen, I think if he died to give it to me, it's valuable enough for me to pursue it. And I want everything that is mine in Christ. And the Bible says that in him, mm, I'm going to make myself happy. Every promise, every promise, every promise. Oh, y'all ain't even listening to me. Every promise is yes and and results in our amen. Because in Christ, it's all ours now. Mm. Listen to this. Psalm 29, verse 11. Remember, there's 333 times peace is mentioned. And I don't want to keep you till New Year's. So I'm only touching a few of them. But it's well worth your study to find out how important peace is to God. All throughout the Old Testament, the Bible talks about sacrifices of peace and covenant of peace. Over and over and over again. Why? Because God yearns for his people to be whole. Do you understand that the infinite love of God desires more than you do for you to be completely whole? He wants you to know that life where there's nothing broken. He wants you to know that life where there's nothing missing. Where when you wake up in the morning, you don't wake up to tragedy, you wake up to blessings and new mercies and new loving kindness. John chapter 14, verse 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives. So do not let your heart, do not let Your heart, do not let your heart. Do you know you'll have opportunity to disbelieve? But can I, I, I'm trying, can I say this to you? Never judge your God by your environment. Don't look, don't look at what's going on around you to determine the faithfulness of your father. What we ought to do is, is judge our environment by the faithfulness and the love of our God instead of the reverse. Because if we look at our environment to determine what God's doing in our lives, then we will let our hearts be troubled. And here's the key. You live in a troubled world, but trouble doesn't need to be inside of you. 
nor let it be full of fear. If the enemy can rob you of your peace, he will. You must resist him. Hmm. Re- listen to this. Resist the lie that things are good enough. Resist that lie. Because I've said this to you ad nauseum and I'll keep saying it as long as the Lord has you and I, has you and I walking together. God is the only personality in all of history that can do the most amazing thing that's ever been done today and outdo himself tomorrow. So in the economy of God, there is no boundary. There is no limit. You'll never exhaust the riches of God. You'll never get to a place where God says, you've come to me too often. (laughs) I've blessed you too much. Y'all need to calm down and be a little bit less radical in your faith because you're exhausting the resources of heaven. Never been said, never will be said, because you and I have not even, oh, I wish, you and I have never even yet approached the boundaries of God's goodness, God's provision, or God's love. Mm. Everyone say this with me. Nothing broken. Say la. Nothing. No thing broken nothing but pastor that's pie in the sky no 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 baby that's gospel that's gospel the only reason we would think that's unreal is because we've been listening too long to preachers who have limited God by their opinions, their judgments, and their suppositions. And we've allowed small-minded people to limit God. When they tell us, well, you know what, God will heal you of this, but not of that. God will bless you this far, but not that far. You need to let all that lie go. Nothing broken. Everyone say this with me. Nothing missing. That means if God has ordained it for you, you possess it. So you can possess lands that are populated by houses that you didn't build, that have vineyards you didn't plant, drink of wells you didn't dig, a land that flows with milk and honey not bees and sour cream. You understand? Listen, he said, I, I, we got to understand our God is a God of high standards and he's a God of too much. And we need to just, just mm, keep believing for more. But pastor, I don't need more. Well, if you're only thinking about what you need, you're living too small of a life anyhow. You ought to believe him for more so you can become an agent of change in somebody else's life. If you ain't got enough, you can't hardly ever give it away. But when you've got more than enough, when you can come to church and find out there's a widow woman that's struggling because she doesn't have a car and you got five. And they all nice car. You can walk up to her and say, ma'am, I know you don't know me, but I'm your brother. And I've got something for you because I discovered you have a need. What is it? I hope you like blue. Blue's my favorite color. Because if you don't like blue, I got a red one too. Are y- are y'all following me? That's good, man. Pastor, that would never happen. Not for you. Not for you. My wife and I have a dream. We've not experienced it yet, but we will. One day we will be able to pay off people's homes. That's our hope. We have said that for years. There's going to come a day in a church service, if you're here, you'll see it. When we discover someone's behind, we're going to have the resources that we're going to be able to pay off their house. You want to talk about changing someone's life? When we can get to the place where we're no longer just praying for you and say, go on your way, be well and be whole. When we've got enough resources that we, uh, man, I don't even, we can look at them and say, what is it you need? I got that. In fact, I got so much of that. Would you take some of that? Then we can become real agents of change in the lives of people. Hallelujah, Father. Where was I? Hmm. 
Psalm 29. Did I already read this? The Lord will give strength to his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. So how do we get and keep peace? As I already said, by faith, you've got to understand peace is yours by divine right. You've heard me say it to you before. You have a divine right to be happy. Amen. You have a divine right to be healed. Amen. Ought not this woman being a daughter of Abraham, ought she not to have been healed? Amen. You have a divine right to healing. You have a divine right to prosperity. You have a divine right to a peaceful existence. Yeah. You don't have to live in a non-ending soap opera, but you got to learn to pursue peace. you got to learn to say, you know what, not here. Right. Mm. Glory. How, do you, how do you get peace? A, you pursue it. Pursue means you chase after. You pursue it, listen to this, by the words you use. You know, you can cause peace to evaporate by using the wrong words. How many of you remember the Bible says life and death are in the power of the tongue? If you want peace, learn to use peaceful words. It's what your father does. What, what are peaceful words? They're not troubling words. By the prayers that you pray. By the company you keep. If you and I want peace, actually, if we want to grow with God, especially in the early stages of our walk, there are certain people we got to divorce ourselves from. If you want peace, you can't hang out with certain people who never pursue peace. And if they're always causing trouble and they're always high drama and you want peace in your life, you have got to say but why? Because I wasn't created for non-ending drama. Right. Do you know not one of us, I've had doc, Dr. Jeff has told me this and other doctors, have said, we, you and I, were not created for stress. So many of the diseases we come before God to be healed of come because we're stressed. Yeah. Do you want to know why we're stressed? Because we have no peace. If we had peace, we'd have less stress. If we had less stress, we'd have less illness. Shandaliatai. Psalm 34, verse 14. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3. The steadfast of mind, I love this verse. The steadfast of mind you will keep in perfect peace. Now, if you look this up in the original, it literally says shalom, shalom. The steadfast of mind, the one who keeps God in their mind. Listen to me. In the environment you're in, how would you respond to it if God was standing right at your side? Would you freak out? Or would you find comfort in knowing that God himself, the creator of all that exists, the Lord God, Yahweh, Adonai, the Almighty is standing right by your side. Would you freak out or would you have the confidence to speak out? Would you say, this can't hurt me because of who's standing with me? Yes. Wait, right. right. The steadfast of mind. It literally means the one who focuses their imagination. They imagine God being with them. Everywhere they go, every environment they enter into, every circumstance they experience, they imagine God with them. And we don't have to work too hard to imagine because he said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. So because I keep my mind on God, the result is shalom, shalom. Perfect peace that cannot be disturbed, cannot be unsettled, cannot be removed. I make my decisions now from a place of perfect peace. I ain't freaking out about this. I, I, I have the peace of mind to make a good decision. Yeah. I have the peace of mind to consider what would the Lord have me to do right here. Yeah. Perfect peace. Is this okay this morning? Good. Amen. When you make the right decisions, you'll always get the right results. Yeah. 
Now, I don't want to preach on that. <laughs> but I could say this. Every bad thing, nearly, shouldn't say every. Most every bad thing that's happened in your life happened because you made a bad decision. You went and hung out with them when you shouldn't have. You went to that place that on the inside you knew you shouldn't go. You bought that, and the Lord was trying to tell you not to do it. And so, so many of these things we bring on ourselves where if we were operating from a place of perfect peace, would have never happened. Hmm. In closing, Isaiah chapter 55, verse 12, says this. And this I want to be the, I want this to be the verse that resonates and that we go into the next year with. Right? We're about to go out of 2020. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. And about to go into 2021. And may it not be the same. For you will go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills will break forth into shouts of joy before you. And all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. I want you to know peace. In fact, I want all of us to know peace. There's no denying that unpleasant things will happen. But you and I ought to be so noble of mind that nothing can disturb the peace of our hearts. So that no matter what goes on around us, we stay the same. Faithful, loveful, hopeful, peaceful. Amen.